Well, thank you very much, Hawan, for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure to talk to you. And I know a few people are really excited to hear what you have to say about esports and what you're doing in the sector. Can you please just uh, let the audience know who you are and what you do for Riot? Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Koshi, for having me, and the pleasure is mine. Uh, so my name is Hoan Lee, and I work as the organized play and partners lead here over here for the Riot Paris office. But I've been with Riot uh, a little over five years now, starting as an intern way back in 2014, uh, working on what we called the regional ambassador team back then, then moving through from the Berlin office, where there I was uh, working on the, at the time, the EULCS, working as a player management lead, then over into the league management side, where we kind of worked more on the league governance and as well as the team and player relations side, before moving over to Paris to work on building out the esports ecosystem uh, in France or on a local scale. Um, today, I'm working on what we call organized play, which is kind of the evolution now where we're having of where we're having, as esports professionalizes and grows, we have what we call esports, in our sense, put in Riot was what we kind of did, leave for the national leagues and everything beyond that. So um, our, the LFL, for example, the NLC over in uh, the UK and uh, Nordics, as well as LEC and all the leagues that feed into Worlds. And organized play is all that amateur, semi-pro area, as well as more casual play that we're really looking to develop and kind of really feed in uh, more, more like uh, traditional sports, where when we talk about uh, football or tennis, it's not just a pro area, but there's a whole pyramid beneath that that we're really building out to kind of create this kind of, uh, just create this competitive pyramid and build up kind of this uh, self-renewing system where we can also have the best uh, best pros um, feed out of this system and into the top tier leagues. That's amazing. And from the sounds of it, you probably joined Riot during its fastest period of growth. Uh, yes, definitely. Things were moving very, very quickly. Uh, and then even between the, the small period, uh, actually very funny one. I, I was an intern in 2014. I was given an offer letter uh, to come back as a full-time employee. And the team I was working for actually got reorged and shuttered. So it was uh, my, 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 my manager at the time um, helped me actually find a new job over in esports because he knew I, was always, I had a passion for that. So interviewed for a few roles and then ended up getting the player management role over in Berlin, uh, working really. Uh, and then that was an amazing experience, really working very closely with the pro players and really um, working uh, really. Uh, there, there was a whole production side and logistical side to it, but really our core purpose and role there was to really act as advocates uh, mm. for pro players and for teams within Riot Games. So we were always a thorn in everybody's side because it was kind of our job to be like, we need to do more, we need to push for more in uh, for pro players. But this created a really healthy balance of push and pull where we were able to kind of push for more and more stuff for the pro players while all, also maintaining the business sustainability aspect of it where, you know, um, it, it doesn't necessarily make sense to have steak and lobsters for the pro players, but having a conference where we're, um, we're, we're inviting them, bringing speakers to come talk to them about, you know, uh, about uh, explaining, you know, what taxes and not just not paying taxes, but rather just the fundamental topic of what taxes are, how they contribute to society and why they pay taxes, um, as well as talking about more, um, I guess, more topical subjects from for day to day, such as physical and mental health, um, as well as things from how the league 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 rules works and just trying to kind of get them um, up to speed and kind of give them as much education as we can uh, in the limited period we have with them and when we're able to, able to do that. That sounds like Riot's doing a lot more than I gave them credit for. I already knew that they are leading the way in a lot of areas, but that's that's certainly more than I expected. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we, we do it a lot. And it, 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 every region has their own local favor, flavor of it. So I know, for example, in the North American LCS, there's a very big financial aspect to it where they bring in financial advisors and they kind of give them more general t of aspect of, of, you know, how, how do you manage your finances? Because when when you're an 18 or even 22 year old uh, pro player and you're all suddenly making six figure salaries, you it's a huge amount of money and having these people come in explaining them you know, what their tax responsibilities are, how they should start uh, planning for the future, um, as well as other initiatives coming in from teams such as Cloud9 supporting their educa uh, any education that teams want to do uh, has been uh, really, you know, has been uh, has been a great impact. Whereas so so that's kind of uh, what happened on the North American side, whereas in, in Berlin, um, I personally have a more political science and uh, uh, 
a biology background. So for me, I was really interested in, in, in pushing this aspects of you know, why their health is important, making sure that, you know, they don't burn out uh, physically by the time they're 21, as well as also kind of the important part of, you know, I think kind of the social responsibility of, you know, you know, what taxes represent and kind of for them to understand uh, not necessarily the political aspect of it, but rather the kind of mechanical aspect of, you know, you pay taxes, you know, this pays for police, you know, road infrastructure, public transportation, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this could really kind of help them understand, okay, we, sh- uh, we w- you know, these are the benefits of being a full-time employee, of having these full-time employment contracts, um, and uh, 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 really adhering to local, local jurisdiction with regards to, uh, with, with regards to employment. What's the, uh, what's the main goal here with all these very interesting remits is it to retain quality players and stop burnout and then keep the game growing rather than getting watered down by all these losses of players or is it something different that i'm missing uh, i'll be honest like from personally as uh, from from our team it was really much uh we Really care, really care, cared about these players. Um, so uh, Mark Marshall, who's now the head of competition for LEC, Carolyn Schneiders, who's uh, working now, uh, still working with Riot Berlin on the office office management side, and Victoria Glazer, who uh, now works on, as an uh, as a, a dev manager for the events team uh, over for the LEC. We really just cared a lot about the players. So it was really kind of an understanding. We were very close with them, uh, talking with them on a weekly basis, being there in the studio, listening to them, and really understanding. All right. These are kind of the issues that they're facing, and uh, and I'll be honest, they didn't necessarily always know um, uh, specifically what what these those issues are. But we could get a sense from talking to them and understanding them. Not to say that we're we know more than them, but we all had a l- a little bit more life experience, and that really helped us figure out. All right, um, a lot of these guys are having you know back issues and uh, wrist issues. I um, mean, actually, there was yeah. a very interesting study done by. Um, uh, Jocelyn Duvillier, uh, who's, who released a study with the uh, University of Paris Cap and the INSEP uh, on um, the role of um, physiotherapists within esports. And I think something like 72% of players back in the day had some sort of uh, wrist, shoulder, neck, uh, uh, back injury, or not necessarily injury, but pain due to kind of uh, poor ergonomics, how they were sitting, uh, lack of um, lack of exercise, and so this really kind of made sure, like, okay, first of all, we don't want these people. We care about these players. So how what can we do? Given that we usually only had one day, so about eight hours with them to kind of cram as much information into them as possible. And so it was really kind of like, all right, let's level it up. And also, I think if we want to look at it from a more corporate aspect, and, and you know, this would be my elevator pitch as well, uh, within it's like, <laughs> also, you know, these pro players are also the most visible players of our uh, over the overall League of Legends ecosystem. Um, and so it's important for them to, you know, for them to be able to kind of have a long and healthy career, for them to really take care, to be able to think about these kind of things. And I think also from the mental health aspect, uh, it was also just seeing, you know, a lot of these 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 players were were young, 18 to 21. Um, and, you know, you make a single mistake in game and you'd have, you know, hundreds of thousands of people start, you know, flaming them, you know, criticizing them, whether it be on Reddit, Twitter, Twitch chat. And... Um, some of them had very good support and you know coping mechanisms to deal with that, but not all of them did. And then you know moving to a completely different country where you didn't speak the local language, uh, living in uh, a gaming house with you know five six other people, it wasn't necessarily always these best um, areas. And we also knew that you know they had full time employment contracts, they had access to healthcare, um, um, and so you know it was really kind of uh, destigmatizing the aspect of you know for them to really understand your brain. Uh, Having these, having anxiety, having uh, feeling depressed, it's not a negative thing. It's not a bad thing. It's completely normal. And for them to really start thinking of the brain as a muscle rather than something to be ashamed of, and this really helped kind of uh, normalize things and help players kind of reach out, get the help that they needed to kind of really make sure that you know they were able to kind of really take advantage of the careers and the opportunities that they have because you know you look five ten years uh, or actually five years ago uh, uh, five years ago is when, when I started but if you look 10 15 years ago I'm starting to get a little bit older too 10 15 years ago um, they, you know these kind of opportunities didn't exist you couldn't really be make a career of being a pro player you could win some tournaments and make some money but you couldn't really think about this as having a full-time contract and was playing for you know five ten years I mean look at reckless I mean uh, he's he's been, or I should say so as rather he's been playing around since season one and he's 
still a pro player today, uh, 10 years down the line. Yeah. No, uh, I completely agree. I think many of us are feeling very jealous about it, too. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I, I definitely <laughs> wish my parents let me play a little bit more video games uh, when I was younger, but I, I really don't think I would have ever had the, the level uh, that, you know, the, 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 the people playing in um, the pro leagues today have, uh, especially looking at LPL. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. they're insane. the level is insane. Yeah, it is. The standard is high. Yeah. Um, I know you spend a lot of your time around pro players and improving the the care that they get and the education that they receive amongst many other things. What is your personal ambition that you want to achieve around around this area? So I think it's a little bit different now, um, especially since I'm working. Uh, I'm no longer working for the LEC, but rather working on the French uh, market. And mm-hmm. right now. Um, what my what we originally our our goal two two years ago when I joined was uh, in 2018 there wasn't a pro ecosystem there wasn't um uh, there wasn't a competitive ecosystem to talk about in France and our goal was to build out a pro ecosystem uh, in France and today we have that uh, uh we will be um we will be uh we have now the LFL which is now I think regarded as the strongest le- uh, national league in Europe uh, below that we have the second division the division two. Um, which is also a, quite a strong and quite a fun um, second league with a lot of amateur talent or an amateur and semi-pro talent that's actually feeding into already the national league in France, showing a lot of potential like Vitil and Exekik, who are uh, now in the semifinals of the EU Masters uh, as we talk um, as we're talking now. Um, and and below that too, we now have the Open Tour France, which is kind of an open amateur circuit. And so. By building out this ecosystem, what we're able to do is really provide a place for players, and that goes from everybody from you know, uh, you know, silver scrubs such as myself. Although I hope to hit gold before the end of the season, and and you know, and people in iron and, and bronze, uh, to kind of high, you know, high low challenger players to find a place that they uh, find a place for them to play, and for these people to be able to understand. You know, whether or not I have the ability to go pro and if they do have the ability to go pro um, to really you know go through the steps uh, needed to get there uh, you'll start out um, maybe playing in the student league or in uh, the open tour you know as a high yellow player you know you might get the t- uh, and how this is how a lot of the players uh, uh, go up is you know they have a good performance there they'll get scouted out by either better open tour team or Division Two team, and from there, especially once they hit Division Two, they start learning the kind of the different aspects of pro play. And actually, we, we did quite an interesting study uh, a while back, actually, I think uh, five or six years back, where we kind of looked at the mech, uh, the response times of of between a diamond player and a challenger player. And actually, surprisingly, the uh, response time uh, for a diamond and challenger player is not that different actually um, okay. and what we really uh, what we realized was what really differentiates uh something between a high elo player and i know many people will be upset by saying you know a, you know diamond player is a high elo player but when we will look at it more holistically when we're talking about the top one percent of players i think it's yeah. fair enough to say well i i mean it within this context the difference between that diamond player and a challenger player and a pro player really isn't necessarily mechanics but game knowledge and team play, uh, their, their ability to play within a team. Now, um, game knowledge is something that can be learned, uh, and then um, uh, and the ability to play within a team also is something that can be learned. Now, how they're able to kind of put all those into motion and have the um, the decision making uh, ability to be able to make the right call in the game, uh, kind of those faker moments, the amazing reckless out uh, mechanical outplays, all those things I think is what people would regard as talent. But there definitely is ways to train out the other sides of being a pro player uh, to get to that level. And so, what we really did with this pro uh, with this ecosystem is for first of all for people to understand if they have the mechanical ability to go pro, and it's also if they have the desire to really want to play in a team. And then from there to ha- go through the steps of learning how to play within a team and to get the game knowledge necessarily to get into LEC. Because back in 2015, when I joined, it definitely was possible for a solo queue player to just go straight into uh, pro play and and uh, and excel and succeed. I think um, uh, Niels at the time, but Sven, who's now at Cloud9, is a great example of that, where he joined a, 
and he joined Origin at the time, and it was a four veterans and him, a, a solo queue rookie, and they made it to Worlds uh, in, in in that first year. And now he's you know one of the one of the best uh, ADCs, even though unfortunately he didn't make it to Worlds this year. He's still regarded, I think, as one of the best ADCs, uh, one of the better ADCs out there. Um, that today isn't. Uh, as feasible, the game has evolved, the game has progressed, um, and there's a lot more players out there. And so it's important for um, for that for for there not to for even though there is a gap between um, pure solo queue and uh, the top tier of pro play, that we have those levels in between where people where players can go and level up uh, between each level and really go through. And that's not to say they have to spend you know, a year in the second division and then spend a year in LFL and then before we're going into LEC. There are players who go through it much quicker and some other players who go through it much slower and that just I think goes down to um, there's definitely a factor of luck that plays into it but also you know, their natural ability um, as well. And that was a very long way to say that's how we're building out the ecosystem. And so we want to have something where you know, kind of everybody can join and, and, and play. Uh, and Clash is also an important part for, especially for people who don't fall into that high ELO group, but especially in the high ELO group for them, for there to be a clear pathway to pro and for them to be able to go pro. I think, I think Clash is a genius game mode because it gives the feeling of importance and a tournament style that you see on the streams with your friends or with people that you play with. So I, I, I think more clash if possible. Oh, actually that's, that's one of my, for 2021, that's actually one of my big goals. Um, so I, I, this is where we're kind of stepping out of the pro player aspect here. But um, yes. when we talk about, in-game toxicity, I think there's a big issue, not only in League of Legends, but I think across every uh, online multiplayer competitive game. And one thing that we want to, uh, one, one thing that's interesting is like, first of all, sure, there's that anonym, an, anonymity aspect, but if we think about um, like uh, football, which is kind of sports played by millions across the world, uh, but when you do play on football, uh, you know, Sunday evening with some random people in the park, people don't start insulting each other on, on the field. And uh, although, you know, you can say like, it's because you know you're face to face, and people generally aren't as aggressive as they are in an in an anonymous online environment. I think there's also an aspect to it of where people understand that that game isn't the most important game. If you play in a club environment, what's going to be important is going to be your club matches and your 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 matches um, in that context. And for me, I think it's really important for people to understand solo queue, losing a solo queue, having a bad solo queue game, and other players having a bad solo queue game isn't the end of the world. It's going to happen. And for people to really understand, like kind of start valuing Clash over solo queue and really kind of approach solo queue with not necessarily not an easygoing mentality, but really as looking at it as an environment to practice and to become a better player. And I think with that kind of approach, and I'm not saying that we'll be able to do this you know, overnight and it's going to be a long and difficult uh, process and uh, we'll probably get some things wrong along the way, but I really want to make, uh, change of mentality around solo queue and how uh, the majority of players really perceive solo queue to make them uh, really approach this more as a learning environment and to try harder in the in the clash environment. I I personally think you're right. You're hitting the nail on the head there. Um, I think a lot of the toxicity arises from the sense of powerlessness because mm -hmm. you're playing with four of the people that you don't know that may not be as invested as you. In fact, it, they always feel like they're not invested. Yeah. With you. <laughs> yeah. so, um, but so I think you're right with your analogy of football, but that leads me on to a question I've, I personally been wondering a lot about, which is getting to the higher echelons of ranks. Solo queue is right now seen as the premium version of the game. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's generally how a lot of people are recruited. And the mm -hmm. confusing thing about this is when you go to the professional level, it's a team game. Suddenly mm -hmm. it becomes all about teamwork, communication, leadership, joint mm -hmm. decision making. And that's not stuff that you often learn in solo queue unless you play a lot of duo. So mm -hmm. the question is, you see a lot of solo queue players stepping into professional play and probably stumbling a lot because they've not developed these other skills. And then you've got perhaps people that could be extremely strong team players that never really shone in solo queue. And I guess this feeds into what you're talking about, Clash. If mm -hmm. Clash is perhaps positioned a bit differently, is mm -hmm. this perhaps where you find some uncut gems in players? 
So uh, I think actually that's uh, I'd actually counter there. That's uh, what we're trying to do with the Open Tour France. Now this isn't to say that Clash isn't important, but um, I there is so when we do arrive in the in the in the higher higher levels of play, I will say that any pro player that has the ability to go pro will hit at least Grandmaster relatively easily uh, mm-hmm. because there's a lot. I think although solo queue isn't the end all, and you know. Your challenger, your ranking and challenger isn't going to determine how good of a pro player you are. It is a kind of, it is kind of the best rough indicator of whether or not you have the ability to take in the the, the game knowledge, the decision making processing uh, within League of Legends to hit a pro level. So I. I yep. would I would strongly say take it easy. You're crushing a lot of dreams right now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, oh yeah, that's definitely true. And I'm sorry for those who I, I I have had actually had to tell people this where, you know, if you're 23 years old, your peak elo is plat one diamond four. Uh, it's probably unlikely that you have that you will be able to go pro. Um, so I think probably better to go for a streaming or you know alternative career at this point. But um, and especially you know if you're one trick and that's your highest elo, uh, it's going to be very very difficult transition into a pro pro career. Now it doesn't mean you can't join esports because um, if you look at a lot of the coaches and analysts, they're not necessarily very high elo players. Um, Baylor, for example. Uh, uh, exclusively played Aram, and he brought Fnatic uh, to the semifinals that year. Um, and he literally only played Aram to try to kind of get a sense of what the um, champions did. But yeah. for him, the actual game knowledge was something where he trusted the players to have, and he really exclusively focused on the team team aspects, the communication aspects, the kind of discipline and trust that the players had in each other. And we can see how 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 important that was. And it's unfortunate we didn't get to see how, what two years of that team together would have done because uh, I think they really would have all shown uh, if they managed to if they had managed to stay together as a team. Um, but uh, but yes, but yeah, going back, I think you, you do need to be able to at least hit Grandmaster and Challenger to go there. And that's really what the Open Tour is. Is Open Tour now, uh, just for those who don't know about it, it's a competition that actually takes place. So actually, I can kind of give you a sneak peek of the changes, what's happening to the um, uh, what's happening to the R ecosystem next year. Is that oh. so the, the, the Open Tour, as since it's going to be released in two weeks, we're announcing this Monday. So uh, this should be, we should be good uh, in terms of timing here. But yes. um, uh, w- there's four, so what it's got, the Open Tour is basically four tournaments that happen from January to May. 48 teams can participate, and we take the top 48 teams who register uh, based on the average ELO of, of average MMR, so the matchmaking ra- rating mm-hmm. of the teams. And these 48 teams, they kind of compete in a two day tournament to score a, a number of points to end up in, in the final six. And these final six teams are then in a, a, a six-team tournament, so we're actually just copying the LEC playoff format because it's a really great uh, it's a really great format. So shout out to Max Schmidt for innovating there. Um, and then uh, those the best two teams there will then go into the promotion relegation tournament with the second division. Um, so this is really where we're trying to create a semi-pro and amateur ex- um, environment where. You don't need to have an uh, esports, tr- uh, like a, a professional esports team. You can just be five friends. Uh, we have a lot of university students actually who participate in this as well. Um, who and then they, they, you know, they play together, and you get your kind of first experience in a in a in a semi-professional amateur kind of team environment. Because we're talking about teams that are almost exclusively uh, challenge or masters to challengers, your mechanical ability is quote unquote neutralized in the sense where everybody's about the same level. So what is going to be important is that team play aspect. And here, it's really not that, it's really okay if you fail because you didn't quit your job to go pro, you didn't, um, you're, you're not paying a ton of money uh, to do this because you don't have to move or anything. I mean, all this is all online, so you can do this. And it's really kind of your first taste of high level competitive play. And then from there, if you're if you're really good, you'll generally get scouted out by a second division team where the you really get this kind of next level of of training. So generally, the second division teams don't yet have; they're not to the point where they have the funding to have gaming houses. But they'll have coaches, they'll have analysts, and they'll really be pushing this this um, this more professional side of the game, where you know you you not only need to think about uh, 
being good mechanically, of working with your team, doing uh, VOD reviews, um, learning more about the meta and setting up to the meta, but also having the responsibilities of being a pro player because um, we actually teach this to pro players in the new player orientation, but being a pro player, um, once you become a pro player, the game, being good at the game is becomes... Uh, it becomes a smaller part of what's important in your day-to-day -day life. There's your branding. There's uh, your ability to do broadcast interviews. Um, being on time and being able to wake up in time for the matches and being punctual. Uh, all these kind of things that, that might seem quite simple. I mean, it becomes a much bigger part of your day-to-day -day life. And uh, it's very important for players to understand this. And that's where we have, that's why we've created this kind of competitive pyramid where it's much more okay to kind of fail in the Open Tour France and the Division Two, where you can kind of come back. Versus in the LEC, if you have one or two bad performances on Fnatic, um, you're just going to get eviscerated by the community there. And so this really provides a kind of a, a more handheld way of kind of going up that competitive ladder and kind of gaining the experience that you need uh, inside that team environment. Thank you very much. One thing I know a lot of people want to know about mm -hmm. is a bit more about your day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. working at Riot. Can you can you tell us what you got up to in general terms yesterday, for example? Okay, so um, yesterday was actually uh, quite nice because uh, right now uh, it's very very busy with the um, what in France we call la rentrée. Everybody's coming back from a uh, vacation in August, so nobody's kind of worked mm -hmm. for a month, and we're catching back up with everything. So my Monday to Wednesday is just uh, plain old meetings. But uh, yesterday, I finally got a little bit of time to work. Uh, I was working on the announcement article of kind of communicating all our changes about uh, the semi-pro and amateur system uh, over here in France. We were also overhauling um, our tournament license process for all of Europe, and I was helping out uh, coding out um, the sheets for that. Uh, we're also working on a fun new project, so I was working with somebody on my team to kind of brief him on what we want to do. So uh, doing there, also setting up for publishing for next year for our pro league for the LFL. So uh, a lot, a lot of different stuff, uh, a lot across a lot of different um, uh, different aspects. So I can't go into details for everything oh, no, there, are, there, there is some stuff that, that, that <laughs> hasn't yet been uh that hasn't yet been announced but um it, it's really cool and that's kind of why i really uh love this job is very broad scope of things so i say right now it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of admin work a lot of preparation for next year but um i'd say but four months ago uh, i was working on a uh, on a on creating a digital music festival for the mid-season streamathon and so wow. there's a lot of um uh, at least, at least personally, my role there's there's a lot of ability to go from so many different projects and really kind of get a taste of uh, a lot of different aspects of of not only esports but also working uh, at Riot as in a video as uh, at a video games company. And I've noticed from looking at your bio that you've definitely moved around a bit from America to Europe and different parts. <laughs> there is that is that what it takes to get to where you are, or is that uh, just uh, opportunism at its finest? Uh, no, so so yeah, so I, I definitely moved around a lot, and so um, uh, my just to give a quick context of that, I'm born in Korea, and my parents uh, move or uh, my parents moved to the U.S. Uh, when I was uh, when I was a uh, when I was a still baby, uh, kind of following the American dream over there, uh, and then my father was an engineer and kind of moved over because of projects. I won't say it's a requirement to have lived in a lot of different places, but it definitely helped me and was definitely like really one of the most important parts, not only in helping me uh, be admitted into uh, the, the the university program that I that I that I did, but also at Riot, where when I joined as an intern, they were looking specifically for somebody who was American, but also fundamentally had a strong understanding of Europe and European players. Um, and as somebody who had started playing League of Legends in France, uh, uh, a friend had convinced me i was a starcraft 2 player so when you showed me the game back in 2012 2013 wow. i was like i'm never playing this casual game and uh well you know uh, five you know seven, seven years later I, i'm still addicted to the game and still uh still working for rag games so i guess I, he really made me eat my words so um yeah but that, that really helped having at least that kind of breadth of experience in different countries i think it it does help me kind of more easily slip into the you know into the shoes of the players and like figure out you know no, what what is an experience that they will like? Because uh, something that I've always really enjoyed at Riot is that I never had ROI, a return on investment um, KPI. I'm not I'm not asked to make money for the company. 
because that's very, uh, very unusual. It, it is very, very unusual. I, I've definitely probably spent a lot more money than I've made uh, Riot Games, but um, I think we've kind of had that luxury of where you know we, we've become the largest video game in the world. Uh, we also don't have any paywalls, or we have very uh, uh, yeah, especially we do have to remove. There's no really, there's no real paywalls other than champions, and so people generally aren't. Uh, upset to spend on the game and so for me it's really i have this objective of creating um uh of of creating better play experiences um and then also of of really kind of being player focused i think sometimes it can seem a little bit corporate but really it is kind of trying to create the best experience for as many players as possible um and that's why i also really enjoy this new role of organized play of where it's i'm not just hyper focused now on a on you know on 50 to 100 pro players but it's really kind of looking at you know thou, you know thousands to 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 tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of players of being like all right how does how do we get that system of you know what is in football where you know in elementary school middle school high school you know you have you have different levels of football and then you know the best players can go into club play and then later on into pro play others you know continue on the semi pro level others just you know enjoy uh enjoying playing in kind of uh, amateur clubs on the weekends um and then really kind of imitating that and emulating that and i don't want to say imitate actually because i don't think we should co- copy paste of creating you know something that makes sense for for league of legends and for its players and now more more broadly for Valorant, uh, uh, Team Fight Tactics, and Legends of Runeterra, and you know, soon TM Wild Rift as well, and really creating you know kind of more 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 experiences, and especially for myself, more inclusive experiences as well, because I think um, one thing is is that uh, league is primarily male, and I think uh, when I go to for example like student events uh, at League of Legends, it's a lot more diverse than what we kind of expect it to be. And I really want to kind of push that f- aspect of where, you know, when you think about the League of Legends community, you kind of think about, you know, a lot of toxicity and aggressiveness and stuff like that. But when you get a bunch of League of Legends players together in a room or working on a project to create, uh, you know, a, a LAN or a BAYOC um, a, a, a event or, you know, talking about cosplay and stuff like that, it's a lot of, it, it might be a little bit naive, but it's, you know, it's a lot of good feelings. It's a lot of, uh, uh, it's it's a lot of positive vibes and, you know, really kind of, how do we get that to actually appear in the game as well? And so it's it's definitely a challenge, but you know that doesn't mean it's uh, that doesn't mean it's to say it's impossible. No, it's a no. worthwhile endeavor. Uh, you mentioned mm-hmm. money isn't one of the big problems. Mm-hmm. So what is a problem? What are the challenges that you faced along the way? So uh, I won't say money isn't a problem because it, it is in the sense where unfortunately I don't have an unlimited uh, unlimited amount of money either. So we do need to budget and we need to, we do need to prioritize kind of where where we're going to spend um, that money. Um, and especially because uh, generally, like I'll I'll be given a budget and I'll need to kind of work 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 around that. Uh, but I can generally justify additional spends to make sure we're doing the the we're doing the right thing quote unquote um the other thing is is i hmm, i would say one of the big challenges i guess the big challenge back in when i was working on the eulcs was really like how can we make sure we're giving the high standard of uh uh standard of quality of, of, of care to all the players and then as a, a, on the league governance side is really kind of um uh, really being like, okay, how do we how do we do this in an uh, equitable manner with all the different teams and players that exist? Um, you know, how do we promote new players? How do we make sure that they're given the best chances to succeed? And now it's um, the challenge I would say today is really um, as, as funny enough data and um, and insights because back when I was working with pros, it was very easy because there's only about you know 50 of them. You add the staff and the subs. You know, maybe you're talking about maybe grand total of about a hundred people and that's something where would talking face to face with surveys uh that you know i can design myself uh sending out to them, you can get the data and analysis that you need from there but when you're talking about um organized play on a larger level uh, it's so many people and you know there's there's the, the, the it's harder to really get um the understanding of you know what people want and i, I will be honest like i'm not I'm not super old, but I'm getting older where I can definitely see there is a generational change happening. And so it's for myself, it's staying quote unquote relevant and understanding, all right, 
people who are playing the game, the majority of people who are playing a game today, you know, how are they different from myself and you know, what do they want? What are they looking for? And really pushing myself to, um, to understand that better. What is cool is that we have a very good insights team that will help us uh, do more research. And also one of the cool things about the bright side is like I've expressed an interest in learning more and being able to be more self-sufficient sufficient in that area. So they're actually going to help pay for Python classes. So I actually am nice. equipped with the with the with the tool or with at least with the skills to be able to you know dig deeper into into that data and and, and kind of better create better stuff for uh, for players. That's amazing. One thing that I've been very impressed about from listening to you is you keep coming back to research and data, mm -hmm. which is obviously going to make <laughs> us very happy. Mm -hmm. um, but tell us a bit more about that. Do you think Riot will, well, I've got a few questions, mm -hmm. but it sounds like that makes up a big part of your decision making. Yeah, I, I, and I, what I really like about Riot is we, we, have a, we have a philosophy of being data informed, not data driven, because um, as I mean, it's, you know, regardless of all the big advances of big data and machine learning, you know, AI, specialized AI, we're not at a point where the data tells the entire story. But it's very, extremely important to be data informed. I think there's really an importance of not us, not only within Riot, to have the necessarily the the the, the, the research internally to be able to do that, but I also think there's a really important role of external parties to being to doing uh, research so i go back actually to to the study done by uh josan dovilia on who's a physiotherapist who who looked at that where we're looking at health data i don't believe as a private company we should necessarily be looking into the health data um, of our pro players i mean actually with gdpr it's it's much more uh, restrictive not to say that we want to do that but like one of the uh, i can give you a concrete example where that's actually been an issue is before we would ask players for their um uh, allergy uh, food allergy and in information so that we could make sure that you know if they had a shellfish allergy or something like that we could warn them be like oh there's shrimp in this don't eat this be careful or yeah. this has peanuts so be careful but we actually no longer allowed to to do that um because it's considered health information so now we just have to put big signs in front of the food of all the allergen information so um it's a little bit more complicated there but i think overall i, I i'm very very much supportive of gdpr and that right um i think lucy jute and barry young who uh kind of lead our data uh, our data protection team uh do an amazing job of not only making sure player data is protected but uh people like myself we are informed of what GDPR means and how we need to protect that data. Um, and you know, that was a big parenthesis to say, I think there's a really important part of like having reliable health information. And especially when we talk about research studies, it's been, a, it's been sufficiently anonymized for us to be able to look at the, at the study and be like, all right, what are, what are things that we should be investing in or what are we should be pushing? And also for the, um, uh, for the teams as well, for the pro teams to be able to have that information to understand what are the needs of our, uh, of the pro players and where can we work together? Where can we work to kind of improve that, uh, improve that aspect? Um, Okay, and, and I think that's uh, I mean that's just one aspect of it, but um, I think there's a lot of a lot of different things too. And I think what a pro player is very important. But even with myself, you know, uh, I kind of got cocky, being like, "Oh, I taught pro players a lot of this." But I recently <laughs> had to go to the physiotherapist for wrist issues uh, just about a month ago um, because you know my my posture my posture wasn't great, you know. Uh, I, and then yeah, so I had, you know I had to go and then uh, uh, you know uh do get get a hand re-education kit and you know start doing a lot of stretches and stuff like that to make sure you know that also doesn't happen i think that's important for us to be able to educate not only pro players but just the larger uh larger population of players to be like uh it's a real thing you know you don't want to have a uh, repetitive stress injury uh you know by the time you're 25 you want to make sure you're you're having a healthy balance of not only esports but you know other sports uh, whether uh, or at least some kind of you know activity to stay to stay healthy and to be able to kind of comp uh, to be able to kind of do that in coordination uh with video games because um uh, it's extremely important i think like um i think it's a very very important for pro players uh, to be fit um not you know, from a branding perspective, but if we're talking about a best of five that goes to five games, we're talking about having to maintain a high level of concentration, the high level of decision pe making period under bright broadcast lights with tens of thousands of fans yelling around you. And that's a, 
that's a hard ask out of even even if somebody on a pro uh, pro sporting level um there are very few um or for, uh, sporting events i think formula one is kind of the closest analogies we can do but you look at the level of physical training they also do into that and we look at now a lot of teams in europe especially a lot of the players and uh, um i think lcs too i just have less visibility there so i can't talk as authoritatively there they do a lot they invest a lot to make sure you know that the players are fit their players are healthy and even in the lfl gamers origin is a great example where they're they built their own um, um gaming complex here in paris and they have an entire floor that's just a gym it's just dedicated to that and you know they need to be able to do that and i think going back to where i think it's important is i think it, it, it'd be great to have more research from um uh from from people like your, yourself or institutions like the nhs or other you know other research institutions to give us that data because you know i i i may i have a bs in, in biochemistry but i'm i do not I will be very clear. I do not have the 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 knowledge or the ability to be able to conduct a real health study. Um, it's not something I ended up pursuing or specializing in. And where I can be like, all right, I can find experts to come in and talk about that. I don't have the expertise myself to actually lead that research uh, and be able to make uh, create the right studies in the in these kind of domains. Well, that leads me very nicely to uh-huh. two unfair questions I want to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you? <laughs> I appreciate you might not be able to answer it, but what I, what I would love to hear is: Can you imagine some time in the future where a Riot opens up their API a bit more for research purposes, and b perhaps they potentially start funding some research projects that they want to organize around League of Legends or some of their major game titles? So I think on the first question, I think if you do reach out to our uh, API team, I think it might be possible for you to actually get a higher uh, uh, response rate for research purposes. I don't think there's specifically the API itself today actually gives you quite a lot of um, it gives you quite um, uh, 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 quite a lot of information. Uh, at least what's available, uh, what's 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 uh, what's um, legally allowed to be shared, and uh, I do know a lot of students actually use it to kind of create you know small programs or you know do a little bit of fun projects. But I think if we're talking about more of a research area, so I know for example we uh, for esports teams a lot of them hire data analysts and people with a machine learning or st- statistical background um, uh, background. So one uh, one example is Toki, who's the head of analysis for T1. Um, and he's actually a French, uh, by trade, he's a French engin- uh, software engineer who works with the right API to do a lot of data mining to figure out what are the strongest champions, how do patch, how do <laughs> patch changes affect the win rates, and um, and I, he, it is actually very frustrating for him because there is one variable called the Faker variable where a lot of his data doesn't apply to Faker. And so it's a little bit frustrating where it's just, you know, Faker just kind of, so unfortunately he didn't make it to Worlds, but um, a lot of times, you know, um, you know, he'll be like, oh, this shouldn't work. And then Faker plays it and it works. He's like, well, hmm, that's not what the data says. So <laughs> um, so this is something I think definitely we, we that, can, that, that can be done. And I think we, we can collaborate. On the funding side, um, I think it will definitely depend. And I think this also is goes back to, I think, like kind of more, uh, just the fact that Ride's no longer this the, uh, really a small indie company, but now, um, I mean, I'll be honest, we're, we're a corporation now. I'm very, uh, I'm very glad you confirmed that. For the uh, <laughs> yeah, we're no longer a small indie company. I mean, we got 25, uh, more than 2,500, maybe almost 3,000 employees across the globe. And so, I think like when we're talking about things on a on a global on the global level, uh, so when we're talking about you know, is, you know, big decisions coming out uh, from LA uh, or HQ on you know how esports is going to look at that because those things take time, and I think it does make sense take it to take really take the time to figure out you know what we want to do whereas when we're talking about you know uh, on the european level or on the country level as for myself where i'm working at, uh, just in france it's a lot easier to kind of be a little bit more flexible with the budget we have and kind of figuring out um uh, figuring out what to do there nice and in the same way you've given a bit of a sneak peek i'm, ha- I'm happy to give a bit of a sneak peek too mm-hmm. um a few of us strongly believe myself included in the value of non-invasive objective physiological measurements so what i'm talking about are measuring heart rate and measuring different physiological parameters during training or play or competitive games Mm -hmm. do you think 
if there was validation down that route, we could potentially see these devices being used at a tournament level, for example, Worlds. Is that something that Riot would be open to if it, you know, depending on uh, safety and interest from from the organization? So I, I definitely say, like, um, I don't think that we would necessarily block it, but I think one of the problems there is um, the fact that the team, the pro players, you know, and the teams, they're separate business entities. So in the end, at the end of the day, we can't force them, especially with regards to this, we can't force them to do it. But uh, similar to how we worked with, you know, uh, other, you know, health health professionals that have wanted to do research, we'll generally put them in contact with the team, directly with the teams, with the team managers or the uh, management, so that they're able to kind of directly get in contact and be able to have access to the players. Um, as someone who's, you know, uh, gotten into a lot of like triathlon training and looking into a lot of like, just like on a personal level, like, you know, getting a, a Garmin smartwatch and having a lot more access to data and working on, uh, on heart rate zones and, you know, tempo training, all that kind of stuff. I think, I think it is going to be something that teams are going to more and more open to for them to just better understand, you know, how, how, how the stress peak, how can they manage, you know, uh, the adrenaline and the heart rate during, you know, high intensity games, um, uh, in in competitions like uh, worlds or not even just worlds but even regular season games and playoffs, um, I think it will be super interesting interesting to have the research. But unfortunately, I don't think that's something where where I, I, it's, it's just not something where Riot can be like, all right, you have access to these players and you can go. It's a little bit more complicated where it will have to be negotiated on a team by team basis. I think the it, it, the best way here is really to reach out to the teams. Um, teams individually and work you know work with the ones that are willing to do this and um, i think it's a lot of the pro players too they'll be super interested uh you know especially when you're talking about you know data and how, how to help them become better players they'll be super motivated to learn more about that i think so well thank you very much for your time Hoan. is there anything you wanted to ask or discuss while you're here Personally, I'm just super excited to see um, uh, like interest from yourself and others. You know, really looking more into kind of really leveling up research that's happening in esports. I think we've passed a point now where we can say esports is kind of a niche, uh, something that's really a niche, and it's really it's growing. It's not going to go away. I was actually talking. I remember talking with uh, somebody from uh, security uh, at the Paris at the World Finals in Paris last year. You know, he and he was telling me how he was talking with somebody. Uh, back, uh, he he was from Hong Kong. And he was saying he was uh, talking with somebody back from back in Hong Kong, and they were like, "Oh, so you do think this esports thing is going to go away?" And he says, "Look outside. Look at the audience. Look how young everybody is. This isn't going to go away." And I agree with him there. Where you know, I think the people today, you know, I you know, I started following esports really religiously when I was 16, and you know, mm-hmm. 11 years later, I'm really. You know, I'm still here working in, in working in this industry, and I think there are people now who are you know 10, 12 who love esports, whether it be League of Legends or Fortnite or you know PUBG, CS:GO, um, and, and really any 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 esport out there, uh, Rocket League. Um, they're gonna they're they're gonna grow up, and I don't think they're gonna start hating um, esports at any point uh, in the future. And I think it's gonna keep growing, and I think it's important for us to make sure that esports grows, but also that we are cognizant of all the kind of um, uh, inherent issues there are with uh, video games, which is, you know, the fact that it is a sedentary sport, the fact that, you know, there, I think there's going to be more and more uh, research showing the the potential damage of blue light and screens uh, in our everyday lives. Um, and I think that's really where it's important for us to currently really level up the understanding and the practice of esports so that, you know, it continues. And, you know, like with high level athletes in other sports, that there really is a better and better um, uh, regimen for not only the pro level, but also the amateur level, where, for example, where, like I said, with the triathlon, like I can go to training peaks and there's a lot of amazing resources that have been crafted with years of experience from everything from sports doctors to uh, clinical research and um, physiotherapists and um, uh, a nutritionist and, uh, um, or no, wait, which one is the real one? There's nutritionist and dietitian. <laughs> we're not going uh, to um, say that, but generally uh, it's the dietitian who's... Uh, yeah, who is officially licensed, yes. So uh, dietitians who really have put in the research and, and time to really be like, this is what you need to do to, to train properly. And I think similarly, I think at some point we're going we're gonna to get there with esports, but it's definitely with initiatives, initiatives like yours that are necessary to kind of really be the first step in, in making that happen. Well, thank you very much, Hawan. I apologize for taking so much of your time. I had a, I really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, great. I really had it. It was a great time for me as well. 
I hope I didn't. I hope I didn't bore you too much with all that. No, I I don't think you could. Thank you very much again. Thank you. <laughs>